We will uh, give people a couple minutes to come in and then we'll get started here because we really do have a pretty cool place to show you today. And it's fun to, uh, we think we can go live here. Uh, the signal seems to be strong enough and that's not true in a lot of antique places. So, okay, it looks like we're here. So we are at the heart of Ohio Antique Mall in Springfield. And Springfield is, of course, known for the giant antique extravaganzas a couple of times a year. Well, the people who started the antique mall started that. And they basically turned Springfield into the antique mecca it is now. This place is just immense. And what's great about it is it's full of really nice things. It's not just full of a bunch of junk to fill a bunch of space. There is something in the range of 125,000 square feet of antiques and vintage in this place. I have been here two days and I have seen one seventh of it. And I don't know how much we'll see today because it's just immense. But we're gonna take you around and try to show you a little bit of what it's like. First of all, you walk into this great huge lobby here and there's all sorts of really cool stuff up on friezes and on the surrounding areas and a wonderful bear and lots of cases of jewelry and coins and the kinds of things you keep up front. This place is set up for major, major business. They have a giant bank of shelves and cashier desk area over here where they can accommodate giant crowds of people because they get giant crowds of people here, especially in the summertime, especially on the antique show weekends. Um, there's just a lot of neat stuff. I've had the uh, good fortune recently. Ah, this is it. We are at Heart of Ohio Antique Center and we've gotten to know the um, folks who own this place. Uh, the Burner Brothers recently uh, bought it from the original uh, family that started it back in 1969 was when they started having antiquing in the shows here and I believe the Antique Center has been here 35 years if I understand right. Um, so it's well established and it just has a lot of really great stuff. So uh, we're gonna just kind of walk through and show you some things as we go. Please ask questions, make comments, and we'll try to answer them as we go. There's a lot of specialties here because what they typically do, there are six different, well, no, I think there's actually eight different huge sections like this. So there'll be showcases in the middle and then the spaces are to the sides. And so you get a variety of specialists with one thing or people who have a lot of general merchandise. And it makes it really fun to shop because the variety is huge. I was here the other day and I spent about $200 in about 20 minutes. It was not hard to do. Uh, there's some other shoppers here we'll uh, run into, I think at some point who we'll have to say hello to that you'll recognize. Um, but it just seems like, you know, this is such a great place to be selling antiques and buying antiques because it really is so central to such a big population in the country. So you see a lot of really, really amazing things that you uh, never see. Like, for example, I know this is an axe, right? There are people who collect axes and hatchets, but this is with a safety guard. This was patented in 1898. They made them for about 20 minutes and then they changed the patent. So it's a really, really scarce thing. And that's what's great about this is you're not gonna just see the ordinary, the expected. You're gonna see some fun things we all recognize, but then you're gonna see stuff that's really uh, something else. Now this, it says, ask for assistance, but oh yes, I like to wear a hat. This one's a Blanco glass hat, so a very nice choice, I think. It's the big cowboy hat they did. I think that was uh, Joel Philip Myers in the 19, uh, late 80s, early 90s who did that. And it's priced at 145, and that is really a pretty reasonable uh, price for what it is. Here is a bunch of really cool stuff in the form of bangles. And we're gonna run into somebody who really likes bangles and has been past this case, so we'll see if she bought any. I have to say, I like the, uh, carved pieces especially. Bakelite is just so cool because with the carving, you know, you really uh, get this detail. And then these are neat because they're a combination of Lucite and Bakelite pieces. The figural pins do really well. Um, we know costume jewelry is very popular right now in general. I see a lot of certain kinds of things I'm not used to seeing a lot of ordinarily. Higgins glass, I've seen several pieces in the mall. This was made in Chicago in a small studio very, very hip with the modernists. They also have some Holt Howard you don't usually see down here, the square ketchup and mustard. Um, the napkin holder with the butler is an unusual piece. And so, yeah, you're just, uh, 
the the fun of this place is that you just get this really amazing variety that you just don't see in very many places like this anymore. Um, let's see. Oh, this is something interesting. I am shopping, by the way, so if I might stop to look at something here and there. That is Tiffany Studios. The Zodiac pattern in the back, that would have been the desk blotter and pad, and then this um, ink blotter, this crescent-shaped thing with the handle was what you rolled the ink with your blotter so that you didn't smear it. Um, those are pretty valuable pieces. They've got 325 on the blotter. I've sold them for somewhere in that vicinity. Let's see what else we have here. Um, like these folks, they've got uh, the Hubley cast iron uh, with the sidecar and the rider. That's what's hard to find is the sidecar because they actually could be detached. So kids would lose those and they were often gone. Um, so that's a hard thing to find. And it's just, uh, it's just a lot of fun in this place. Um, and then there are avenues that go off in every direction. We're on one wing. There are three wings like this and then things shooting out from all of them. So it just, it just goes and goes and goes. Um, let's see what else we can show you down here. I've got to keep talking because we have a little music here and we all know that YouTube doesn't like us to play the music. So we're going to keep on going past. They do have a lot of jewelry here. They have a lot of glass here, obviously. Um, I like the pink pig. I've always been fond of these. The silly thing where, whoops, I interrupted you in the outhouse. I don't know that pigs really use outhouses, but um, uh, we were watching Peppa Pig with a friend of ours today, and, and they certainly seem to. Um, they are trying to reach a younger audience too, and so there are cases that have things like My Little Pony from the 1980s. I mean, the show Stable, and this was a bunch of money when it was new. Most of them got thrown away, so now $60. Uh, there's another case we'll see on the other side that's all strawberry shortcake. So um, they're doing that, but then they're also appealing to more traditional collectors. Cast iron is really big in this part of the country, so we've got a whole wall full of it here. And they've got the Griswold with the small circle, and they've got the Griswold with the bigger circle when it merged with Wagner Ware. And so you really can, uh, what's nice about a place like this is that you can see a whole range of things that were done and get an idea of all the different stuff that a company made. And so if you're a collector, it's a way to really see and touch and feel and get up close and get more familiar so you can kind of, you know, curate your collection and take it in the direction that you want. Um, let's see here, or back behind us here. Yeah, there's a very pretty case full of glass here. I like to point this one out because everybody calls this Blanco or Rainbow, but this is actually Bischoff glass, this blue piece, which you'll get to in a minute. I know you got to just sort of, Zeno is the cameraman today, and thank you very much. And he's having to hold the camera really slow and steady to make sure it works. But this is the Bischoff piece. It's got a handle, and Blanco and Rainbow didn't put handles like yours on their bottles, so that's how we know it's by them. They were another of the West Virginia companies that are popular now and they've obviously got uh, um, some artists like Arthur Carlson Percy, this blue, this steel blue vase, that's an unusual color. And then there's just fun silly things like the Viking clown or the Leo Ward bluebirds of happiness that we see. So, and I bought a couple of those yesterday actually. Uh, one great thing too is that they have help in each area. She's got the keys with her. You don't have to go find somebody to help you here. They actually serve you here. And that's part of why they're able to maintain so much stuff and have a, um, you know, a, a continuous supply of things and keep things selling so that these dealers can afford to stay here and bring more things to you is because they provide service. So um, what are we doing? This is Oh, <laughs> yes, that's right. Thank you. I'm getting the high sign from the cameraman here. Um, so by the way, this is on the Antique Nomad live channel. Uh, we also have the regular channel, the Antique Nomad. So if you are watching us live and you're not familiar with us there, uh, please check that out. We also have a shorts channel for people who are in a hurry and just want a quick little dose of something that we're doing. We do little short form videos. So um, check us out on all three of our channels, please. Now we are uh, yes, that's right. The links are in the description of any of our videos under the dashed line. Um, 
Let's see what else we can show the people here. These folks have sold a whole, whole bunch of stuff. I mean, people will come in here and if they like a category, they'll just raid it. This case was full when I was here two days ago. And they, the folks who own this place um, told me that they had had a, a big paper ephemera dealer come in and I can see that because, and I see the prices and I kind of see why. I mean, with what's left. Look at the parsnips. Yes, I like that, Canadian parsnips. I've not seen that before. Yeah, and that's only three dollars, and it's just sort of fun for the Wait, graphic. Look like that. Um, well, <laughs> yeah, you they know. Seem to be dressing that way most of the time. Well, there's that one summer month. <laughs> 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 this isn't something that we see in Ohio a lot. This is Rick Weiss Carver, and um, you'll also see another name that this was sold under. This is late '70s, early '80s, when there was a lot of interest in Native American motifs. This is all done here in um, the Ohio area, and prices are between 75 and 150 there. That is typical. We do see a lot of retail price here. I have to say, I haven't seen much that I thought was overpriced here, though. I think people are realistic because, again, they're here to sell. So uh, let's see. And some of them have multiple. Um, booze, but what I think is interesting, and I like this, when they come in, they mark down when they restock. So if you're a regular customer here, you don't just walk by and say, oh, well, I think maybe I saw all of that. They actually let you know when they came in and brought fresh things, which I think is pretty clever. Look at the random Judy Jetson just thrown down there. Yeah, I'm not sure how she got there, and she's face down. I think she's had a <laughs> shopping fit of some sort. <laughs> uh, let's see what else we can show you here. Well, we are looking at a really amazing arts and crafts picture here. Um, this is priced at $2,900. All of this is hammered copper, and this is older. This is mica with the shades here. Um, so this is, this is a pretty amazing thing. Um, uh, I would say that there couldn't be more than a handful of these left in existence. Buck Rogers Stratokite. I mean, it's just so fun because it's like a walk down memory lane. You might see anything in a place like this and things that you've never seen or things you haven't seen for a long time. So um, let's see what else we can show you here. Well, we're going to try not to interrupt here, but uh, we are here in part because a friend of mine invited me to um, come and meet the people who own the mall, and that's how I've gotten the opportunity to do this. And that friend is right behind me here. Um, but she's in a conversation, but that is Jocelyn from Crazy Lamp Lady, and there's one other person that we'll see in a little bit here, too. Um, let's see what we can do. Uh, this is the first time I have been down this aisle, so we're going to discover this together. That little part that we went down is just about the only part of the store I've actually been able to shop until now, so we'll see what's in the back areas here. Um, oh, Private Benjamin, I remember that movie. Goldie Hawn being in the army, it seemed a little far-fetched at the time. I think, uh, coming soon, and they do actually take vendor applications, but they vet the dealers pretty seriously. So you're probably gonna have to have some experience to come in here. This is something I did not know existed. I know they're starting to reproduce ceramic Christmas trees. I did not know that at a certain point, they were making them commercially as well. I think of them as being something made at home, but this one was done probably about 1980, and there it is in the original box. So that was something I only learned by coming here and seeing it, which is part of why I like antique malls like this, is because you're going to be exposed to something that you haven't seen before, and that's how we learn. Um, oh, there's a nice uh, shelf full of Fenton Cranberry which uh, I guess this is because this is primarily a kitchen and glass dealer, but then they've got the uh, red dots, one of my favorite patterns. That's kind of hard to find. And a little bit of depression glass because we're in the area. This is a nice piece here. This is called Bellware. Uh, it is very similar to Wave Crest from that time. This is gonna date to about 1900 with the hand painting of the two children and the enamel in relief there. Uh, this has a custard tone to it. If we took it out and put a black light to it, it might just glow, and we know she would. She is a really beautiful Czech glass perfume in the Vaseline yellow from the 1930s, and she's priced at $2.95, but in this market with so much interest in Vaseline glass and uranium glass, as people are calling it now, 
um, that is one of those pieces that would be like the must-have piece for the center of your collection. Um, again, there are some more modern things coming in because the market is changing. There are people collecting character figures and comic books and things that we would not have necessarily thought of. Legos. Friends Lego set, yes, exactly. I, I will reserve my comment about that. Um, <laughs> I don't know whether the Friends Lego set is actually an older one or not. Um, this is fun. Oh, we should show this because we have a, uh, I don't know if he's watching, but if you're out there, my Pepper fan, I'll, I want to show this for you. Dr. Pepper calendars from the 1940s. Now we see lots of Coca-Cola stuff from that era. You don't really see a lot of the smaller brands. And so these are rather hard to find. And I thought it'd be fun to show those to you. We have Royal Crown as well. All these great hairstyles. You're covering up a fun one. Am I? Trip. Oh, yes. The half price sale for Trend Soap. It's so great you'll kiss it. <laughs> That's funny and a little odd. I think this is a little more realistic. She's just happy that she has a clean blanket. She's not making out with the laundry detergent. But um, yes, you're doing a great job of it. <laughs> But they have all sorts of really neat uh, stuff. A lot of these would be printed and then they would, um, you know, they'd have extras that were never distributed and most of them got recycled or thrown away. But the ones that are left are new old stock that have never been used. And the people who collect these, by the way, it needs to be January. If it's ripped off and it's March or April, they are not worth nearly as much, even if they're in great shape otherwise. Um, let's see what else we have here. We're in farm country, so we're going to see a lot of farm signage. Oh, the raccoon coat. Oh, this, this is neat. Well, let's see what it says about it. It's uh, 1920s, which is definitely right. You can tell by the clips here and these very large leather-wrapped buttons. Yeah. This one says that it is by the Dietrich Furriers in Cincinnati, so I think we will take this off and put it on. We'll try not to scrape the microphone for you. Yeah, I'll be careful with that. But oh yeah, a good coonskin coat was a must-have if you were a 1920s collegiate prepster. You had to have a coonskin coat and it's nice and heavy and warm and we're starting to get into that weather where I have to admit I kind of like this. And I think it would look really great if I accessorized it with the bows of the clown shoes there. <laughs> Those just make me laugh. It's a professional clown shoes, great condition. Apparently they weren't professional for very long. Fall City Trade. Yep, that's uh, Fall City out of Louisville. That's, you can tell by the bottle, this is right after Prohibition when they started making the trays and the beer again. Anatomical head study. I know this stuff for some people is kind of graphic and gross, but anything like this from an old lab, an old college, an old doctor's office, definitely highly collectible these days. So if you see those sorts of things out there and you're a reseller, definitely take a look and give it a chance. You might do well with it. Let's see what else we have here. This is kind of a fun space that, um, you know, part of it is I, I want Zeno to divert us to where he sees things that are interesting because he looks at different stuff than I do. We've got a whole bunch of talc tins. It's interesting because the talc and henna tins they had a brief flare of revival and popularity last year or the year before, and it seems like they've quieted down again. Um, so now you're finding really good ones again in like the 10 and $15 range, like they had them there. Let's see what else we can show off here. There's, there's so much, I kind of don't even know where to start. This is a nice old paperweight, and it's a, they called it a scramble because it was just sort of spatter, and they make paperweights by doming glass over other things. So this has two layers in it. And then the top layer is actually done for somebody who was involved in this organization. Sometimes these say friendship, sometimes they say mother, but look at the back and how worn it is. That is really important to see. This is how they finished them in the old days. So when you see these ones that are ground off flat and it's all just a grind like this, those are new, they're offshore and they're generally not worth a whole lot of money. So don't be fooled by imitations. Um, I know it's hard because you're trying to film too. Are there any questions or things I should answer? No. Okay, you'll let me know. 
Uh, let's see what else we can show while we're here uh, because there's just so much. I don't even really know where to start. This is an interesting. Oh, did we see? It's not, okay. Um, over here, I really like this piece just because of the backlighting. This is chalkware, and then the light comes behind and you have a piece of glass in here, usually frosted. Uh, typically, we see a dog in a round, or like a German Shepherd in a round um, casting or a ship. Uh, the two quarters is a little bit more unusual. Those were popular in the 1930s because it was an inexpensive way to make those things. And if you don't mind staying right there, I'm gonna walk back and look at one thing I'm interested in just to see. This is a ship's decanter shape. And I think this is Blanco's turquoise. It is, it's got a lot of wear. It's a nice old piece from the 60s. It's priced at 160. With the price of decanters the way they are in this interesting shape, I would be tempted to make an offer on this but it's got a lot of lime scale in the bottom and that can be really difficult um, to remove. I've had to send them off before and have it done and it costs like $50 plus shipping each way to have it done. Um, and so you folks who have just come into this, uh, we are live. We are at Heart of Ohio Antique Mall. We have not done a live in an antique mall for a long time, but we found out that we had good signal here in Springfield, Ohio. So um, this is a huge antique mall, probably the largest in the United States, and it's owned now by a, um, a pair of brothers called the Burner Brothers. They used to have an auction here. Their auction is now online but they took this over about seven months ago and it is just a huge labor of love for them. They're very excited about it. They've started doing a YouTube channel of their own so you can check for them. Um, we definitely have been doing some filming so we'll introduce you to them that way. And they actually did an interview with uh, Jocelyn, the crazy lamp lady and I on uh, their channel so you can check that out too. That's uh, Burner Brothers Auctions. And I'm gonna keep talking because we're uh, in a music area, but this is kind of neat because it looks like it is, um, yeah, it's off of a Ferris wheel, exactly. And this one, uh, this would be fun to make into a porch swing, uh, but you'd have to have some money because, and something really heavy to, yes, a good beam to support it. Uh, the Ferris wheel was quite a thing. It was the another World's Fair invention. It was introduced at the 1893 Chicago Fair. I love the poodle lamp. $89 on this, it is vintage. That's a pretty reasonable price. I've seen them sell for a hundred and a quarter. So it's not quite cheap enough for me to buy for resale, but it is a bargain for a collector coming in. Um, wow, here's, if you like tools, there's an entire space full here and they've got all the sorters, which is what I really want. I, I, I like these racks a lot, uh, but the racks are very collectible now too. And if you can find them for sale, they're usually about six or $700 these days. I have a customer looking for one, but she wants a small one and she's on a budget. So I'm afraid it might take a while. <laughs> uh, we're getting near Christmas. So blow molds are coming out. There's the nativity set. Let's see where else we can go. Cute little child size roll top desk. I sometimes gloss past furniture because um, we're getting into furniture season now, but it was slow over the summer. But things that are a little bit more unique, the size of this is just really great if you have a kid, especially because, you know, kids can be messy. Some prior owner back between 1910 when this was made and now colored on it a lot. So the kid makes a big mess and look, it just disappeared. And that's what's great about roll top desks is all those things, the bills, the notices, the paperwork you really don't want to deal with. You just pull the lid shut and it disappears from view. And it's like it's not there until you're ready to deal with it again. <laughs> or, you forget about it. or you forget about it. This is an unusual color here. This is Morgantown glass. And this was a fellow named Ox, uh, or Oxner who did the design on this. So it's called the Oxner Jug. Uh, but you almost never see it in this shade of green and that's why they have 135 on it let's see what else we have this place is really really vast this looks like a new dealer just starting to move in and ooh, i like the lamps sometimes dealers that are just moving in price things cheaply at first because they don't know what the market is like yeah, that one is not cheap but that's a that's probably gaetano scolari 
Uh, no, nope, you're right. They're, they're not cheap. It doesn't always work, but I always do look at new dealers when they come in because sometimes they're coming from a place where the things they're selling are not as desirable where they are as where you're taking them to go. Uh, let's see, more tools. I think this is probably the same tool guy again. Uh, let's see where we are going here. Wall phones. I would love to pick up some colorful wall phones but they have all gone up to about this price. Um, we're in the $95 range to 125, and my friend who's a telephone dealer in Seattle is ch charging that now because he said they're just hard to find in good enough condition to keep his inventory up. That is one thing with collecting is when something is really hot and then it stops being hot, it's not always because people don't want it, it's because all of the good stuff got sucked into collections and now people aren't finding it. Um, so that does happen sometimes. So if you like something and that's really hot in the market, well, either get it fast or hope you get it cheaper later. Um, but if you're looking for things that used to be hot in the market and are selling for less, that's when you can get some real good deals as a collector. I like these blenders. I don't know why. I'm just a sucker for this one that sits in the center because it looks cool. It's not that it makes any difference in the way it operates. It's just a style. Those were actually sold by Sears. Oh, I could use one of these. This is actually not a bad price at $85 now. I used to get them for $25 and sell them for $65. And now pretty much I'm seeing them for at estate sales. I'm seeing them for $65. So $85 is not a bad deal now. You just kind of have to keep up with the market on things that interest you or that you uh, tend to buy repeatedly if you're a reseller um, because those numbers change. I'm paying what I, uh, last year I was selling cocktail decanters for $25. Now I'm paying $25 and selling them for 50. This is a whole lot of stuff. This is one thing that's interesting about being in Ohio to me. A lot of old buildings have been lost. A lot of old houses have been lost, but a lot of architectural pieces that people can use to renovate their house or their piece of furniture or give an old style to a place that's new. This is where you get that kind of stuff. They have uh, the brass doorknob set. This is actually Heise glass. They made doorknobs early on before they went into mainly tableware. So these are gonna date to around when they started in 1897. And so uh, it's nice to see these because they really do look different than the reproductions. Uh, there's just something about the casting was different. Things were thicker and heavier then, and you just don't get that same look with a modern reproduction. They look thin and you can tell the difference. And so this is a really nice uh, assortment. If uh, uh, Let me get on the other side and go out here. Let's see, a bunch of printer's trays. Now, these don't have any of the dividers left in them, but they're only $12.50 a piece. And this is what these used to um, sell for this pretty much with all the dividers in. Nowadays, people are collecting the tin type, or the drawers that those fit in, and so they're not selling them individually. So finding them at that price is getting to be hard now. So that would actually be something to maybe come back for. Um, Breweriana. Let's see what else we've got here. We're gonna walk by this music real quickly because I don't want to have to talk over her and get us in trouble. Whole showcases of Christmas. There's several showcases of Christmas related things in this mall. Um, this one's got lots of nice ornaments and the, the rubber faced Santas are gonna be 1960s and 70s. But in the back there, you have one that's felt and chenille, and that's going to date to the 1930s or 1950s, the one with those beaded um, arms and legs there. And so those are kind of neat and something different. We're definitely going to have to move away from this speaker, though. Um, well, we were just talking last night about how it's so crazy to us that all this McDonald's stuff from the 60s and 70s is now collectible, but it really is. Here's the entire... McDonald's drive through with everything, including the old tray return back when you uh, walked back and threw the tray in for them. And it's priced at $250 because finding all the pieces together is really hard now. Those things went to kids, kids lost the toys, they, a piece was gone, mom and dad threw them away as soon as they moved out of the house. So we really don't see stuff like that. We were talking about it because um, 
uh, one of the people at the house last night was talking about how they had uh, little McDonald's aluminum ashtrays that they remembered from them when they were a kid, and this is in the late 70s, are selling for like 25 and $35 now. So amazing how time passes on. Oh, we should show this in tribute to the late Suzanne Summers. This is her 1978 poster right before she left Three's Company. And uh, yes, yeah, she was uh, quite a looker and battled cancer successfully several times in her life, but finally in the end it did get her and so uh, she will be missed. Oh, and speaking of which, uh, there's another one, Farah, same, same story. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Oh, this is interesting because the butterfly chairs in the 50s usually couldn't fold down. This was an unusual variety where you could clip these and fold up the pieces. Now I know it needs repainting. This needs to be dyed or trimmed or something, but believe it or not, at $125, even in this condition, if you were willing to restore this, you could double your money. No honorable mention to Miss Teagues. I did not see Miss Teagues there, but I think Miss Teagues is still alive and well. <laughs> So we'll uh, let her have her life before we uh, tribute her. Uh, Cheryl Ladd. Oh, it's Cheryl Ladd, okay. Oh, and Ah, the Cheryls, yes. Yes, all sorts of uh, ladies who, uh, several of whom used to be a blonde on Charlie's Angels. It was funny how that was the thing, you know, how they make the joke about the guy in red on Star Trek is the one that gets killed. Well, in Charlie's Angels, the blonde in Charlie's Angels was the one who disappeared the next season. <laughs> Um, let's see what else we have here. Oh, this is quite something. And this is one thing that's fun in this part of the country too, in a mall like this, is you're going to see big things. This is a big letter press from the 1890s. So this was actually how we were making handbills and flyers. There's your paper. And then you have this gigantic thing with the rollers and the ink and this presses and you just make copy after copy on it. It's so amazing now that a machine that's about this big can do the same thing. <laughs> We do live in a rather remarkable era, but the fun of this is that we get to enjoy all of the past eras that have been left behind. You see, there's a bookseller here. Okay, so now I have an idea what's down this aisle. So we'll just keep going and see what else and go around, go up the other side. who else we see. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that. Yeah, the nice thing about this is as big as it is, it's not a catacomb where you get lost because everything comes back to the center so you can find your way. Now there's a nice big Satsuma vase, and this is priced pretty reasonably, I would say. This one is priced at 175 so let's see if we can figure out why. Satsuma started to come into the market in the 1870s from Japan, and it was considered a luxury item, and so they were very finely painted. Then there was a second generation where they became more mass market for the middle class, and they were nice and not as decorated and then they became really kind of cheap stuff that was really poorly decorated. So when we look at this, it's got a lot of gold trim. It's got a nice export mark, a little bit of wear around the base. And then when you look at the detail here, I would say this is medium quality detail. Definitely a lot of detail in the eyes and hair, uh, but not quite as much detail in the painting here to make it really, really extravagant. So that tells me this is second generation. And even at that, for this size, if I had this piece on the West Coast, I might double my money on that. So that's one we'll put in our head to think about while we're walking around here. Uh, let's see what else there is. Oh, Mason's Ironstone. Now, the original owner of the store and his wife, um, they sold out to our friends about seven months ago. They used to go to Europe and they loved ironstone and especially decorated ironstone from England. All of this is Victorian, some of it, uh, or early 20th century. Some of these are Masons. Um, some of them are other companies. You usually see a nice mark on the back. Notice it uh, does not, it does say England. So this is after 1891, but not too long after. And actually, it's funny, it says Masons, but that's actually Ashworth Brothers, so a different maker. These were very, very, very collectible for a long time. The prices really haven't budged in ages, and because of that, now they're starting to be a good deal at these prices, which are anywhere from about $35 up. Um, what's that now? Uh, I did want to thank all of the members who are watching today, too. 
and all of the patrons from Patreon. We really do appreciate your um, contributions that help make it possible for us to take trips like this and get the technology we need to be able to go live inside a store like this, which is a pretty recent thing because a lot of these metal buildings have been very difficult to do this from. So we're really excited to get to bring this to you. Um, if you're not a member and would be curious about what that entails, there are different membership levels and different perks that come with each one. And you can look uh, below the dotted line in the description of any video under memberships and it will tell you all about it. Uh, let's see what we have. This is a really fun thing. I love the paper hats. I love putting them on. This one actually is patriotic red, white, and blue. And they claim, and they may be right, that this was actually something worn to celebrate the passage of the right for women to vote in 1920. I did not know they had those paper hats then. Most of the ones I see are 1960s and 70s novelties. Uh, we are near where Fiesta is made. A lot of these are original colors, and then some of them are later colors, but some great designs. Frederick Reed did all of this in 1936, and what an amazing designer he was. Fiesta is so well known today that everybody thinks they invented these ring patterns, but actually uh, companies like Catalina Island and Bauer were doing them several years before, but Fiesta really refined it into a design that has just lasted and lasted through time. Um, let's see here. There are lots of fun things to see. I like that they have a bunch of airplane models. I got interested in these when I lived out in Seattle because so many airplanes are made out there. Uh, but um, they're getting to be more and more collectible and more and more difficult to find. So I will get past the speaker here. What's that now? Oh yes, yes, I like these lights. I haven't had one for a while. This is um, something that would have probably been in your dentist's office or your doctor's office because it reflects and they can see really well with it. I remember as a kid, the dentist had something that looked a lot like that and it was blinding and I didn't like it at all. <laughs> but um, I was uh, probably a pretty good patient, so I always got a lollipop, <laughs> which was kind of funny coming from the dentist. But um, let's see, what are you seeing there? Oh, yes, have to show off the fabulous penguin hot cold keeper in chrome there. Uh, that is just the classic thing. And we all kind of laugh about how there were, um, you know, there, there's something you see in almost every antique mall. But the reason is, is they're still popular. It's a great design. They really do keep the stuff hot and cold. I have one in my collection and I typically sell them for about $25. Spider. The spider is really interesting. There are people who really like spiders and bugs and things as um, designs. We also see a lot of snake jewelry, but the red is very unusual because of the way they clamped on. It would take the paint off, so usually they're just gold. And that was a response to the movie Cleopatra with Liz Taylor in 1964. And suddenly everybody, including my mother, ran out and got snake jewelry to wear on their arms and around their necks which is really funny because my mom in real life was deadly afraid of snakes and wouldn't go near one, but yet she had snake jewelry. <laughs> uh, another nice case of jewelry here, and this one actually has some nice uh, 14 karat gold pieces, some nice cameos in here. Um, again, every time I look at prices here, it seems like if it's not a reseller deal that I'm getting, it's still a good price that a collector could pay and feel good about getting. This rug area. I don't know Oriental rugs well, but this dealer really does. And this was another thing. A few days ago, somebody came and bought $20,000 worth of rugs out of here, including a few that they knew were really, really good. And this is such a specialized area um, that, uh, you know, the rug market right now is really depressed. So the fact that they sold so many, somebody has caught on to what's good and what's going to be not made once the refugees get out of the camps. Uh, the famous Matador painting, this is interesting to show. They have a big price on it, but I think something the dealer doesn't probably know, because a lot of people don't, look in the right corner. It says it is by Carlo. Carlo is not really a painter. This is a factory production painting. Uh, Lee Reynolds is another one that you see. 
And they're perfectly cool and they're nice, but it was basically like a line of workers who painted the same thing over and over and over with a signature. So Carlo is not a famous listed artist. They just made cool stuff in a production house. I think that, uh, I think because we're in Ohio, we should spend a little bit of time with elegant depression glass because so much of it was made here. It's really beautiful. It's an area of the market that was really popular 20 years ago that is not really catching a lot of new collectors, but I think it will eventually because the glass, the patterns are great. This is Imperial's, um, uh, well, it's Ruby Caprice. They took the old Cambridge mold and made it in their color in the late 60s. This is Duncan and Miller. Um, Nurse Flipper came to an estate sale I did, and we had a bunch of the little cocktail glasses. They had sat there for three days. No one would buy it. I sold them to her for $12. She sold each one individually for $35. She made a ton of money. And I, I said, yeah, people are overlooking this stuff, but there are still collectors. Um, Fostoria Brocade is a nice uh, satinized with the etch. Um, behind there's another Fostoria with the etch in the green. And then we get into the Cambridge nudes. These are definitely valuable. She's priced at $65. When I first started in the business, she would have been priced two and a half times that. So if you're interested in really good quality glass, the reason they called it elegant glass is because they fire polished it and it was just a little better than the depression glass. And then we're strawberry shortcake time. <laughs> and Zeno. Read their name. Zeno grew up with this, so we have to go through. So we have Orange Blossom. I did not grow up playing with this. <laughs> he didn't play with it, but it was on TV. Angel Cake with Souffle. Yes. Souffle is the little critter they there. They all have a pet. They all have a pet. Crepe Suzette with, with Eclair. Mm -hmm. Apple Dumplin with Tea Time Turtle. It's so silly. Mint Tulip with Marsh Mallard. And then Lemon Ada with Sugar Woofin. Oh boy, I, I feel like I'm gonna get diabetes just looking at this. Um, there's, now there's the purple pie man and sour grapes back there. Yes, and those were the important characters because they were the ones that were not so nice in Strawberry Shortcake. <laughs> and I have to say, the few times I've been subjected to it, I was rooting for them all the way. <laughs> but um, I, I broke down and I recently bought this same lamp for $2. They have 20 on it, they sell for about that. So all of us who are in the business are having to come to grips with the fact that it's not just about what we grew up with. This is now 40 years old. So there are 50 year olds who grew up with this. This is their nostalgia. They are the up and coming market. And so, you know, things change with time. And so we see wonderful old time collectibles and like, for example, this huge box of silver plated napkin rings and toothpick holders, little figurals. These are priced between 15 and $30 each. And they're a hundred and some years old and they're really cute and they're fun to use on the table. Here's another one with the uh, nice leaf pattern on it. That one's priced at 30. But then, you know, the reality is in this day, we might as easily sell some of these really awesome uh, squared off shoes. Yes, yes, those are right out of the 90s and I have to admit um, I'm a pretty conservative dresser for the most part but I have a shoe thing and I at one time would have owned any of those. <laughs> but then we get back into here and then we've got examples of the kind of things that we see a lot of people interested in now who are redoing houses. We've got these really great um, uh, acrylic lamps from the 60s uh, there's, uh, this is a really nice, um, if you like the really bright orange, I think this is California Originals. We'll see if we can see under all that fruit. Oh, no, this is actually Hager, believe it or not. That is a Royal Hager piece. Because Hager, being in the center of the country, in Illinois where they produce this, they would, they would follow these trends, but usually a year or two later than the Pacific Coast pottery companies that started them. Hager outlasted all of them though, which is interesting. And then we've got this chunky lucite uh, or acrylic lamp here. I just, uh, I think a lot of this stuff is really fun. It used to be things that I got very cheaply. They're not cheap anymore. People have caught on to all of this. Yeah, these are different styles of Aladdin lamp bases than we usually see. This one is, um, I'll move these out of the way. This one is sort of an Art Deco leaf shape. 
Ah, very good. The finials behind the counter, that was the thing that is so important with these. It's got its original switch, which works. And the important thing is, does it have the finial? Because the finials match the lamp. So if it has a regular plain finial on it, it's not complete and original. And it says that they've got the finial located at the sales counter. So um, that's a good thing, because those that makes those viable. These are interesting, spatter gourd vases in glass. No idea who made them. They do have wear, they have some age. I like the color. Oh, these are fun. Yeah, there's a pair of these and they are, um, so they almost look like linoleum print, but I think they're a different kind of screen print. Yeah, for the pair 150. I'm curious how much this is. I don't think this particular space is going to have bargains for me, $60 on this, but it is a nice little piece. But again, this store is a combination of things that are bargain price and things that are fair retail. This is an interesting Blanco picture that uh, you don't see too often from the 1980s, actually, with that texturing. And Oh yes, I like the Italian uh, lamps with these uh, fixtures. Now these are priced pretty well. This is priced at 105. I honestly think it could double that in the right place. And then there's this. That is garish and it has fake velvet. I mean, this was, this was definitely very ersatz, <laughs> but it's also loud and interesting and fun, and it would be fun to decorate around. You know, some people who are really into kitsch, they want the whole thing to just be fun and light and silly and over the top. They're not necessarily looking for high style, um, whereas other modernist collectors, they want things that are, you know, high style by designers and very smooth and streamlined looking. So uh, it's interesting, each generation, it seems like there's a group of collectors that goes for really serious things and a group of collectors that go for very lighthearted things. And I like all of it, so that makes it easy for me. Um, this guy here is really neat. He is a devil claw candle holder made of cast iron. That's from about 1900. There was a lot of, uh, strangely enough, a lot of devil motif stuff came about in the 1900s and 1910s. I think it was partly because of temperance and prohibition and all, but it was also a fun motif. Schlitz globe lamps, this is, uh, they're hard to find in working order now, and so the prices are big. A lot of pretty blue glass there. Uh, what else can we show you down this aisle? And then we'll see if we run into uh, some other folks we know. Oh, I'd like to show this actually, if we could. This is AR coal pottery. This is out of Seifert, North Carolina. You notice it looks like Francoma sort of, but notice how it breaks up a lot and it's very dark under the glaze. It's not the same as a Francoma finish, but a lot of things, and it's redware, so it's gonna be bright, like a brick red on the bottom. Francoma, was brick red in one period, but mostly the early stuff was on beige, so something different. And uh, by the way, if you're enjoying this, please give us a thumbs up. It always helps us with YouTube. Uh, it lets us, it lets them know that um, people are interested and then they promote it more, and then we get to grow our antique and vintage community that way. So um, we really do appreciate that. Uh, let's see here. I love that piece. I don't know anything about it. It's more modern. It's carved cameo glass, of course, and it's based on a Toulouse-Lautrec um, illustration. But I'm not sure who the maker, oh. Um, yeah, it doesn't say who the maker is. Oh, and in front of it was something that I, th oh, 94. I was hoping that was 44. The toucan there is Alexandrite glass, and that's the glass that looks purple in one light and blue in another light. And I always buy that piece if I can get it for about half that price. They have it priced about right retail. This area is entirely sports memorabilia. Uh, and one thing that's fun about this place is that whatever your interest is, you can probably find some place to lose yourself and have fun looking at things. And if you're with a bunch of people, they can go look at their things and everybody has a good time and something to compare notes on at the end. But they've got uh, I think over here is probably the older stuff in the booth, and mainly the punch cards I think are fun. Let's see what we have down here, and let's see if we can figure out where uh, everybody is gone. Let, so this is another aisle. 
Oh yes, the Black Carnival tent. Now, a lot of people seem really interested in this Black Carnival right now. They did a lot of it right around 1970 for a brief while. Um, black had not really been used in carnival glass in that manner before. The uh, little you were there. Yeah, that is rainbow glass. They have $50 on it, which is a fair price in the tangerine. Rainbow glass also made the blue cruet here. And so if you memorize that shape, a lot of times the labels are gone, but you'll know what it is. And then behind that, they have a bell that is one of the Fenton Burmese satin bells. With, and that will glow under a black light. Suddenly, just recently, it seems like there was a lot of interest in the bells in particular that are highly decorated, particularly from China. Uh, Chinese collectors are getting into them. So if you're a Fenton collector, you might want to get your stuff now before it starts to leave the country. Bench. Yeah, the bench is really great, actually. That's Estelle Laverne, and I actually talk about that in a video. So look for a video coming from here soon. I'll tell you a little bit more about the Lavernes and why they were of significance. Do we want to try to go back this direction or do you want to go straight away? Okay, we'll go this way. All right, let's see what else we can uh, point out along the way. I want to make sure everybody gets to see a little bit of a lot of stuff here uh, because there's so many interesting things. We're not going to stop on every one of them. But, uh, oh yes, the trapeze toy. That's actually a pretty good price. I would be surprised if that worked for $48, but if it did, that's kind of a steal. It was by Marks Toys back in the 1930s. Uh, Lewis Marks did all, and the chain company in New York both uh, were the primary makers of um, tin toys, along with Ohio Art and a couple of smaller people. Planet of the Apes. Some of these TV and movie related uh, are becoming the most collectible of the, of the um, lunch pails. It used to be Roy Rogers and Dale Evans was what everyone wanted. Well, now they want that. <laughs> oh, yes. $30. Lover's Embrace. Yeah, now see, this seems like a good deal. This is Hager from the 1980s when they started making large pieces to sell in furniture stores and places like that. That's how they stayed in business longer than almost everyone else is by making something that would be too big for imports to compete with. This is only $30. It's got a date on it of 1986, which is about the time they started a lot of these lines. And it's just a really nice design. I think Hager is still a little undervalued because they outlasted almost all the other American potteries. And so I think a lot of people mistakenly think this is still in production, still available. I would say that's a pretty good price. And then the loving couple here, also at $30. So we may back, be back to look at these a little bit uh, later for resale. I'm not trying to um, put a bunch of stuff at the counter while we walk around with you folks, but I definitely am putting a few things aside in my head to take a look at. Oh, in front of the Planet of the Apes, I wanted to show these. These are nodders. They are not bobbleheads. They were called nodders and they are um, paper mache or ceramic. Bobbleheads are plastic and they came about in the 1980s and 90s. And yes, they're essentially the same thing, but the older ones in the ceramic are the ones that are mostly the most collectible. Let's see what else we can show off. Okay, I have to show this because personally, it's not really something that I have ever gravitated towards, but this is a stiffle lamp. Any lamp with a stiffle label in brass, and especially now that brass is more popular again, is immediately over $100 just for saying stiffle. And sometimes they can be several hundred dollars depending on the design, and that is completed sales on eBay. So it may just look like a table lamp to you, but if you are a reseller or if you have something in your house that you're thinking of getting rid of that's brass like this, if it's got the stiffle label, make sure that you look into it because um, you might have a pleasant surprise. And then coverlets. I almost bought a coverlet here yesterday, but the one I picked out was a blanket rather than a uh, jacquard loom where they were woven together. Uh, but you do see these in this part of the country. This is a great thing. This is a Civil War drum. It's uh, from one of the regiments. Uh, it, they're, they give us a lot of information here. Um, it says that the drum maker William S. Tompkins, and he was well known, was the one who created it. Are you noticing the Seattle World's Fair glasses up yep. above? Yeah, that is something I always look at because so many people went to the fair and brought them to this part of the country. And if they're cheap, I buy them and take them back to Seattle and sell them. 
to tourists from this part of the country who bring them back. <laughs> uh, so, well, I can't see the prices on any of those. Um, one thing that somebody told me recently at an antique mall that I'm in, they said, would you please put the just the dollar sign on the bottom of the tag so if it gets flipped over in the case, people can still see it. And I thought that was such an easy solution because there's so many times that you can't see the tag on something and then you're stuck and you don't know if you want it or not because you don't know how expensive it is. Ink stands have always been appealing to me. This is Bradley and Hubbard. It's the stag and hounds pattern, and it's got the two ink wells in the copper tone. They were mainly known for brass, but this has the coppery bronze finish. Okay, let's see what else we can show. We've got discount double stamps, but it might be time to, um, let's see what we have here. Go to number one, yes, exactly, yes. I've been told that there are some things at the end of number one I might like to see that are bargain price. There's some great stuff in the showcases here too as we walk by. I'll talk more about a lot of this stuff in my video because they have a lot of nice things loaded right in the front of the store. And including some really hard to find advertising pieces here. Uh, the Champion Spark Clothes sign in the glass, they almost all got broken. And this one, the neon works and everything. And yes, it's a big price, but antique advertising is just really popular now. So we're going to go across here. They have a cafe here, too. I mean, they know you're going to be here a long time, so they have it all set up so you can spend some time here and not feel like you have to run off to someplace else because even though we're really close to Springfield, Ohio, we're on the outskirts. So there's really not much else here other than this huge antique mall at this interchange. More jewelry. Another big satsuma piece. Oh, I showed this in a previous video when I was here because I think it's so fantastic. That is linoleum. And that would have been something they would have put maybe in a school or in a kid's room or that sort of thing. There are very few of those big full sheets of linoleum left intact. And I would think almost none that were this. And I mean, it's got the Zeppelin at the bottom, uh, which tells us it's before 1937, because as soon as the Hindenburg exploded, it was almost as if Zeppelins had never existed, which is why Zeppelin related stuff is very collectible. And we are, I think we can show them, actually, if I'm careful walking through here. We are here. All right, so we're going to do the crawl over the carts here, and then let's see which uh, way we can go from here. Um, there is some nice furniture in this store, and it's a little hard to get back enough to really see it, but I will point out this with the parka tree the geometrics here with the inlay. Um, let's see what they say about this. I think it's a European piece, and yes, they refer to it as a Welsh dresser, uh, which means it was made somewhere in the British Isles. Welsh dresser means that it has these open shelves for display. Usually you would put plates in the back, and then maybe your cups and things that you used every day, and you'd put your nice things out so people could see them, and that was your decoration. That was before people had uh, big fancy china cabinets and things like that. Oh, this is an unusual piece, actually. This is a brush pot. These are from China. They were to hold the big brushes used in their calligraphy and painting and that sort of thing. It is a form all of its own. There are people who just collect brush pots. This one is made out of bamboo, and it is very highly carved with dragons. It looks like something that was made probably right. I'm seeing some dovetailing probably right at the end of the dynastic era, going into the nationalist era about 100 years ago. And it's priced at $6.95. There's such interest in those in specifically and in Chinese art and artifacts in general. So let's see what else we can show you along the way here. Um, now, this is something that some people are concerned with in malls, but we are in a part of the country where the Kentucky rifle, as they call them, these are very early handmade pieces, and this is what people on the frontier had to have to survive, and they're very collectible now. And these are really interested in terms of uh, interesting in terms of they have a lot of um, information about where they came from. Some from Pennsylvania, they have the makers on particular ones. When it says Ohio gun, it means it was made here because they know local people may be more interested. 
Um, they're percussion rifles. They've been restored. They're all in about the seven to eight hundred dollar range. These are not things that people are really buying to use. It's for display. It's for the history behind it, and that says so right here. And notice they have not been test fired or certified for shooting. What they're telling you in a nice way is, don't shoot these old firearms. Um, it's they're just to be collected and enjoyed for their historical importance in time. Uh, ooh, I like that. This is Dom Nancy from France, and this is 1920s. They had to hand blow the glass to form so that it would and then do the iron work. And it's really, really difficult to do because you're using heated processes several times, so the chance of breakage was great with those. Um, so very hard to find. They were mo known before that for cameo glass, and this one's priced at 950. And for that piece, honestly, that's probably about the right price. And I've always liked these with the sort of um, jazzy, deco-y looking dancers. I don't see them very often. They're always priced about 275. Again, I think the people here are knowledgeable. It's not that you're not going to find some bargains, but it's more about collectors finding really serious things that they are looking for. Um, ooh, this is. I just like this stuff, and I seem to point it out a lot, but this is Hall China. And Hall China in the 1930s came out with this Chinese red. It is such a hot color, and these deco designs are really great. Some of them are really, really, really hard to find. This one's called the basketball teapot. You almost never see that shape. That's why that one is $500, and the airflow is $100. And I know the airflow sells for that, so I don't think these are pie-in-the-sky prices. Uh, crocus is a transferware pattern that they did that's very popular from that time as well. Um, and while they're, uh, they were really known for teapots, and you see there's a whole bunch of different varieties that may, they made, and while teapots may, uh, or Hall China may not be, um, you know, dinnerware may not be the big collecting thing it was 20 years ago, teapots are back. Oh, this. <laughs> it's got the shade. I've always liked the Venetian shade, and I've never seen one printed with juvenile subjects on it before. That's actually pretty cute. And it says, gray 1950s deco style child's teddy bear lamp. I'm curious if we could figure out who made the lamp. I'm sure it was one of the Ohio Pottery Companies. It's glossy like Royal Copley, and that would be my guess. It's one of the Sebring potteries. This is neat. Oh, well, we'll get to that, too. The jewelry's great, but I really like the dresser boxes in here. These green ones, most of them are going to fluoresce under a black light. They're 30s era um, uranium, quote unquote, glass. And so, uh, yeah, some great styles. Love birds, the woman sitting on top. And then, yes, jewelry. I'm sure that uh, one of the people who's with us has uh, looked this over pretty well because she loves this sort of thing. And most of these seem to be legit. There are some reproductions of the dots, but these all look like they have the aging that they should to be. Um, there, were, there were some done in the 90s that you have to be careful of, but I think these all look right. And then we've got the napkin holders. I always like the Scotties with the red eyes. And um, these ones with the, they're supposed to sort of look like the Trilon and Perisphere from the World's Fair in New York. We'll go through a bunch of depression glass here, which I still love. I know the market's not what it was, but I just think it's beautiful. And I think it will come back at some point. Obviously, the green is coming back because it's the color that fluoresces under a black light. So green, suddenly you notice there's a lot less green in the case than there are the other colors because that has already made a comeback. What's that now? Look at this color. Oh, this minty shade of green, yes. Typically, the mint greens do not fluoresce under a black light, but there can be exceptions, so you do have to test every single thing. And then this is teal. This is Jeanette glass in the ultramarine color, and this is a child's uh, set. It would have originally come in a box. All right, let's see what else we find down here, because, again, we're getting into all new territory for me. Um, a color I really like is Capri Blue from the early 60s. I've always liked the swirl. The flower power plates are kind of fun. And it's not terribly expensive. It's still pretty easy to collect. Jadeite chip in it? Yeah, I don't know that piece at all. 
I have to say that is not familiar to me and I'm a little suspicious of it, but without taking it out. Um, let's see what else we can show everybody. Oh, these are interesting. I've had one or two similar to this. This is Costa Boda, Swedish company. Costa and Boda merged. And a lot of these hand-painted uh, pieces were, um, sometimes they're signed, you've got the signature there. A couple of different artists did them. Uh, these are 1990s era where you started to see faces and eyes and Picasso-esque things coming into art again. Uh, I think this is supposed to be Adam and Eve with the serpent. Uh, but Costa Boda has been around for a really long time and the modernists really love it. It's priced at $239, which I think is not bad for that. Uh, these, yes. It used to be nobody knew what to do with these. Well, now they're popular as bars. This actually was a hot plate here by Salton. And then they would provide that and then the furniture company would make the rolling bar card. It's nice because you can, you know. Is that it, a drawer? It's, I think there's a drawer, yes. Yeah, Ooh. that's a, or a, a cutting surface actually. And then this should flip up and that's more storage there. So a lot of people are using these as bars now, but I'll bet it still works. Oh yes, yeah, this is interesting looking. I don't know who did this. It's not a jure, but a lot of other people use nails and things to make abstract modernist looking uh, wall art at the time. And I think a lot of them were just people doing it as metalsmiths because it was fun for them. So we don't necessarily know who made those. Hey, and yes. here she is. This is. I'm Kate. Yes, this is Kate from Follow the. Uh, Follow that bug. Yeah, let, let, let me have you say it so it comes out right. Follow that. Follow bug. that bug vintage. Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I'm what'd you find? I'm so excited because I left this here in September. Oh, and it's still here. Oh, that's Shocker. lucky. I Shocker. know because a lot of stuff is turned over. I went to a case I was here three days ago and it's half empty. I'm just like, wow, they sold a whole lot of stuff. Get the other microphone. So, oh, yeah. Did you see what Jocelyn got? I didn't actually. Is she right around the I'll corner? I'll show you a photo. Okay. You'll like it. Just, just hold it. Okay. Here. This is what Jocelyn got. But I had to take a picture with she her She bought it? Yeah. Oh, my Pick goodness. Pick that. That is so great. I, we saw that piece in the case, actually, as we yeah. were walking by. Oh, I, I can't said, believe she got this it. Is, <laughs> this is a photo opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, wait, did you, wait, you said you got it? Yeah. Okay, because I saw someone carrying it out. Yeah. yeah. That is awesome. That's a great piece because, I mean, it's a super tall swung vase, but it's really narrow. It's the yeah. drapery kind with the it's feet, really and they cool. almost never swung those that big. It's usually the fat base that so they did, so. It? It's a Viking. It's Viking, yeah. yeah. It's a, yes. Um, well, hopefully we'll get to show it uh, to you um, later on, actually. Yeah, I can't oh, yeah, wait yeah. to put it in my Ford Fiesta. Oh, yeah, that'll be fun. Well, yeah. we have a car. We can take it for you. It's more fun if I make Jocelyn put it in the Ford Fiesta. Oh, that's though. true. Yeah, make her hold it like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a swung vase. Look. Oh, you yeah. got it. I'm so excited that you got that. We were just showing that actually. And were you? Yes. And then he's noticed that it went up to the counter and he's like, oh, that went up to the counter. And we should have figured. It was me. <laughs> it is so oh, awesome. Did, were you able to make an offer on it? I made a $500 offer. Cool. Oh, that's great. I think it's really unusual. I mean, you don't see the footed swung like that in that size ever. So, yeah. yeah. Hope you don't mind being live, by the way. Surprise. No, okay. <laughs> hey, I know. Well, he's making all these like, gestures that I keep looking at. I'm like, what is happening right now? I know. So I find he's like, mm, and I'm like, what? And he's like, mm. he's, I'm like he's yes. He's sign language. He's got all these special codes. We're, so getting, like, <laughs> <laughs> we're getting the full on sign language. Well, I am so excited that you guys are finding stuff. I'm glad that that was there for you still. Yeah, me too. She was very excited. And she I'm, found me a poopy doll. I did. Oh, what is that? A poopy doll. Oh, it's everything. It's everything. You have to see it. Okay. It's so good. Oh, that's good. You well, know, thing. I think it's um, it's P O U P E E. Ah. Uh, and it's like an artist doll. Oh, how nice! It sounds it's nicer than it sounded. It's got a bird on, on it. Head. Oh, well, there you go. Put a bird on with it. A, with a berry. Oh, that sounds like, cool. It's amazing. Oh, yeah. that's great. It's like you're not gonna believe what I just found. I'm like, yeah. and I actually found one of the vessels. So you buy them and they come in like vessels. But I found the vessel once at Goodwill, and then I found out, oh, this whole poopy doll thing. And now I have a doll, but I already sold the vessel, so I'm like, Ah, oh. uh, well, hey, that's all right. Now you can go look for a vessel. This is what we do, right? Right. I've never found a complete set. Yeah. 
you know, the thing is, though, if you hold on to it for a million years, you won't find it until you yeah. finally give up and sell I've this had one. Of those <laughs> I'm like, oh, here's a fairy light part that I might find the rest of it, or I could just marry something together and exactly. make it work. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, hopefully, there's someone out there in our viewer land who needs the part that you have, yeah, and then maybe. everything will be just fine, yeah, right? The, the poopy doll with the bird on the head. Now, I can't guarantee that we're going to do this, but we might go live later. And so look for Crazy Lamp Lady's channel and uh, look for Follow That Bug. Uh, if you're not subscribed to them, you should be. Uh, they do great stuff. It's really fun. Uh, you'll have a, uh, they're a lot less dry than I am. You'll have a good time. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, I now have seen one sixth of the store instead of one seventh. I, I can't believe how it just goes on and on and on. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, don't not doing my buttons. job. Don't push buttons. Okay. <laughs> I, I do. I do need a keeper, folks. I do have to be told. This is really something. Isn't it awesome? Oh it's been yeah. Here a while. I have a friend in Seattle who does modernist furniture and anything that's old and leather and tucked like this, he's just like, I can't keep it in stock. So I should actually take a picture and send it to him. I know it sounds crazy, but I mean, I sent him a Laverne brass table from Florida. Uh -huh. And even with the shipping that doubled the price, he was like, it's still a great deal. Send that's it. Awesome. So, so who knows? That might have to. He might want it. He might want he it. Might need it. He might need it. Well, he <laughs> needs everything. That's the problem. <laughs> he can have what I can deal with. <laughs> Oh, that gosh. Oh, yeah. See, oh, well, that's a good thing to show, too, because there's a lot of that's talk about how Victorian one. never sells. Don't hold it toward me. Oh, I know. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, how Victorian is, oh, it's so big, and who can accommodate a thing like this? People who have these kind of houses can accommodate a thing like this. Um, we're going to have a video coming out. Uh, Jocelyn and I are going to each have videos coming out about this uh, crazy place that we went on a house call with our friends, the Burner Brothers, who own this mall. And that house could take about 20 yeah. of these. Oh, yeah. So there is a customer for this big, beautiful old yes. furniture still. And it would look amazing in there, too. Oh, yeah. We had people, um, when I was running a big furniture store, they would be building, like, some McMansion, and they would come in and buy all this architectural stuff and this yeah. huge furniture to have built into the house while they That's were building incredible. it. So there is a customer, folks. If you've got a great, big, old Victorian furniture, you might be surprised. <laughs> Awesome, yes. Well, okay, I'm going to go this way, and I'll okay. see you in a little while. Oh, yeah, we're going to get noodles at some point. Okay, yeah, we'll just catch up. We'll finish whenever you're done. Okay. <laughs> Is seriously closed? They close at 6. We we'll probably won't stay till oh, close. Okay. Yeah. My stomach is rumbling. I'm like, I need noodles. <laughs> we'll find us before. We're just going to go down and loop back. <laughs> yeah, we'll go down and loop back and come find <laughs> you. Cool. <laughs> okay. Oh, yes. We'll put this back. There we go. So that is the story of how I ended up in Springfield this week, and it's just been a really, really fun, wonderful experience. There'll be a lot of fun video footage, and you'll get to see some adventures that we've had and a big buy that I got to make yesterday. All right, let's see here. Um, boy, all of these are interesting. I uh, just sold a piece very similar to her for about $700. This one's priced at $900. I imagine you could take an offer on her and get her for about this price. Very popular in the 19 teens and 20s to have these figural lamps with all the leaves, lots of things that could break or get bent, wiring that had to be kept. So finding them in good condition, not so easy now. Uh, okay, what else do we have? Oh, Halloween postcards. Halloween was just starting to become a fun holiday for kids. Before about 1910, Halloween was not what we think of it as now. It was actually a time of, uh, when they say trick or treat, it was because bad things happened on Halloween if you weren't nice to people. Um, but by the teens, Halloween is turning into a time for witches and black cats and fun things and people start trick or treating and it really changes things. It becomes more of a juvenile holiday. And the postcards are right at that time, so it kind of reflects that change. There was a, uh, one of the things with the, um, the quarters kissing on Halloween there, uh, I've had cards before where they have the woman sitting in front of a mirror. It was a superstition well into the 1910s that if you sat in front of one of those dressers with the two candle stands and lit the candles, that an apparition of the face of your suitor would appear in the mirror on Halloween night, and then you would know who you were supposed to look for to marry. Seriously. <laughs>
So people have believed some strange and interesting things in much more recent time than we think. Lots of cool 1930s and on up cars here. I always look at cars, but um, I have to admit, this is one of these fun cases that just has a ton of little fun toys and some black memorabilia, which a lot of that was made in Ohio. Uh, then there's a whole shelf full of dogs. Uh, so people are definitely having fun here and collecting what they like to sell and bringing it in. A camera dealer, I didn't know they had a camera dealer. I mean, they've just got about everything in this place. I, I don't know of a category that I can name that haven't seen. Oh yeah, the rookie card. Mm -hmm. So this is an exception to the rule. I usually tell people avoid 1980s baseball cards because they massively overproduce them. But the Ken Griffey Jr. rookie card and a couple of the other ones, they especially like Ken Griffey Jr. Uh, because he was a great player, but also because he was not caught up in the steroid scandal at that time. And so his reputation has remained. Ooh, wow, this is fun. Oh, I've got to sit in this chair. This looks like an Ames chair, um, but it is more likely to be a Mr. Chair or one of those that's a knockoff because it's not quite the same design, uh, but they are every bit as comfortable. The original Ames chair of this era would sell for somewhere in the $4,000 range, and this one's priced about half of that. And I always have loved this chair. Oh, I could just sit here. <laughs> but we have things to see, so let's keep going. The treasure craft cookie jar. Oh, yes, the dog. Yeah, the St. Bernard with the barrel and the little hat. Yeah, that's a silly guy there. But uh, yes, and it has the Compton, California yes, mark. Treasure craft. Why is that important? Uh, well, Treasure Craft is important to me because I wrote the book on them, but the reason I did it is because Treasure Craft and Pottery Craft were the last major California pottery company. And it turned out that they made wildly different things every decade of their production, and that's how they stayed in business. When one thing stopped working, they just discontinued it all and started with all new stuff. And so um, it made it a really interesting thing to research. It took me about a year to write that book. And um, if you are interested in... Uh, that book. Um, you, you might want to get one. Uh, I'm happy to have you go to the antiquenomad.com um, and you can order it through there and you'll get a signed copy uh, including postage. And the reason I mentioned it is that I'm hoping sometime uh, later this fall or in the winter time when we have a little bit of time to do it that we will, uh, I want to do a special about treasure craft and pottery craft, talk about why they're interesting and tell some things that were not able to be talked about in the book. There's a few little secrets that will come out. So look for that. Uh, let's see what else we have. Ooh, look at the pink shoes. Those are fun. Women's Oxfords with netting, $45 from the 1940s. And boy, Nordstrom's would probably buy those for their shoe museum if they don't already have a pair like that. I started buying old shoes because we were selling a lot to Nordstrom's when I was in uh, Seattle. Um, they actually were the first people to buy swung vases on a large scale. They got into it years ago for their displays. Oh yeah, you see these a lot actually. These are for clipping baby blankets or that sort of thing. And they're, uh, they're early hard plastic like beetleware or something like that. This is a neat thing. Oh, look, it's like that thing. Oh yes. Yes, I had this, but I had an original one. This one is a reproduction. Uh, the original one I sold to somebody in France for $1,000, the Jaguar um, effigy vessel. Uh, but this one, uh, first of all, from the price we know, if you were to moisten it, you would smell that it smells like wet clay. The original smell like um, rotting garbage because it was adobe, basically dried in the sun, so it had natural materials that would decay over time. This is a Bakelite radio, or Catalan technically, because it's a color. You don't see those very often at all. They've been expensive for years. This one's 1400 That doesn't surprise me. They all seem like they're about that price. There's just not many left. All right, let's see what else we can show. Oh, I have a viewer in uh, Ohio who collects this. She's not far from here, so maybe if she's watching or sees this video, uh, she'll like this. She likes overshot glass. I do too. Uh, Fratelli Toso in Italy made it in the 20th century, and I suspect this is a 20th century piece, but they actually um, did that back in the Victorian era too. And it's called overshot because while the glass is still hot, they basically spray pebbles of glass on top of it to give the texture. 
oh yes, the Viking orb ashtray. They came in two sizes, that's the large one. $90 may seem high, but ashtrays are popular and ruby was not a color. Even in the Viking catalog, ruby was 10% higher because of the chemicals they had to use to make it and that it was rough on the equipment. And so they charged more for it. So not as many people bought ruby. That's why you see a lot of amberina because it gave it that color tone without having to be red. Here we've got military helmets and you will see all sorts. Um, uh, this one is Prussian or German. Um, they call these pickle haubas because of the little spire on top. So that's the classic one there. I just found a Blunique orb ashtray at Goodwill for $1.99. Wow, that's great. Who is that? I didn't get to read the name. Oh, hi, LaDonna. Nice to see you there. Why are ashtrays popular? Um, ashtrays seem to be really popular with a young group of collectors who did not grow up in the smoking era, but they think it's fascinating that at one time everybody smoked and had to have an ashtray. And so particularly the large ones like Treasure Craft made that were shaped like leaves and you could put 20 cigarettes in them. They really like that kind of thing. And I think it's just because of the novelty of it. Um, there is a theory that the legalization of smoking certain other things has brought an interest to it, but I don't think that's actually the case because that would have already existed. Um, so I think it really has more to do with just, it's a thing from the past that seems unusual and funny and interesting to a younger group of collectors just starting. This is a nice scale actually, and not a bad price at all. It's Christian Becker, this is a balanced scale, uh, similar to what would have been used for um, weighing gold back in the old, old days. This one looks like it's late 1940s, and I think it's even got its original information in there. Portion Balance Company. Boy, at $129, I'm tempted by that. I've sold these for as much as yeah, double that. Oh, you want to see yeah, what it looks it like? Damage. No, it says that the material was in good condition when delivered. Any breakage or damage oh, is the carrier's responsibility. In other words, they're saying, don't send it back to us. Tell UPS they messed up. <laughs> What's the clear owl? Uh, the clear owl. Am I looking right at it? I'm missing it. Oh, down on the bottom there. Um, I don't really know who made that one, to be honest with you. It's a little clunky around where it's formed. It makes me think that it might be, um, it might actually be, um, oh, possibly from Mexico or someplace like that. Um, I, I don't know that piece, to be honest with you, though. And over here. Oh, my. <laughs> That's actually cute. The advanced showing of General Motors 1967 new model cars. Wow. Oh, here you go. Apparently at one point you could shoot those 18th century rifles if you went to a special place to do it and they charged you five bucks to shoot one, just like Daniel Boone carried. Yeah, this is interesting. Okay, I like these. Uh, you see a lot of these banners. This is very popular in the early 50s, just like shields in logos are popular now and were popular in the 50s. This was very popular at that time too. Um, car companies had these refrigerators, appliances. It'd hang up in the rafters of the store so it could get you to the department that they were selling such things. That one's priced at 115, which is kind of typical. I like this one better too because of the graphic. That's really great. And this one's in really clean condition. It's only priced $5 more than the other one. I think this one dollar for dollar is a much better piece, honestly. And look at the Technicolor food. It's almost real. The cupola. Oh, is there a cupola behind me? Oh yeah, that's kind of cute, but I don't think it's very old. Well, it's still neat looking. There's a Hager piece there. What else can we show the folks? Who else is in the chat? I haven't gotten to say. Oh my gosh, well that's a lot of you, but thank you for joining us. I really am enjoying getting to show this to you and I'm really glad that you're uh, coming along with us and having fun. Um, oh. Oh, look at Super Neutro Hog. Super Neutro Hog, yes. I bought something out of this case when I was here the other day, but it was not Super Neutro Hog. Maybe it should have been. That's pretty that cool. <laughs>
Yeah, actually they have... Uh, oh, wait, are those little, those, those little Pris things? Uh, it's the puppy version. Those it's things. similar to Miss Pris, but those are the puppies. And yes, they are at least as hard or harder to find, actually, than Miss Pris the kitty cat. So, What else can we show you while we're headed this direction? Um, are these old? Yes, they are actually, and they're bicolored. This is by Tiffin Glass. Tiffin was made in Ohio in the town of the same name. It was the third successor to a bunch of other glass companies, but they made some really good modern pieces. And in the 50s, they started doing a lot of bicolor and a lot of, uh, they did a lot of the Alexandrite glass and that sort of thing. And, you know, the bicolor stems, like there's, when it's pink and green, they call it um, watermelon glass. Anything bicolor typically sells for more than the same thing in a solid color or a clear. Boy, there's just oceans. I mean, there's another entire section this way that we're probably not going to see today. Um, there's actually several sections this way. So by the time we get done, you will have maybe seen the front aisle of this store. That's how big it is. And that's why we thought it'd be fun to bring it to you. We know a lot of people have done video from here, and we've done some too that we'll show you soon. But we really wanted you to have the opportunity to kind of experience it as we do. Oh yes, that is a uh, fishing bobber with the mm -hmm. smiley face. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was the 70s thing because then the thing on the surface was smiling at you, unlike the fish. <laughs> Was there a question there? Was there a question there that we saw? Okay. Um, let's see what else we can show you along the way here. This is all new to me in this area, so I'm just kind of picking out some highlights as we go. Uh, we've kind of been ignoring the spaces, but the spaces actually have some neat stuff in them too. Look at that shield thing with the ship. The ship, yes, exactly. Yeah, this is a fireplace screen. I have always liked these. No, I don't think I should sit on that drum either. But yes, it's a fireplace screen, and the idea was to give you a little bit of protection from the heat. Also, in the old, old days, it was to keep you from uh, having your makeup melt. Uh, but this one's fun colors 1920s and it's priced at 175 and that's about i've sold floral ones for about one and a quarter they're more common so i would think the ship would be somewhere in this range great colors though right out of the 30s make so much more money since Zeno dragged george to youtube oh <laughs> Oh, that's nice. Well, Yvonne apparently said that she makes a lot more money since Zeno dragged me to YouTube, and that is true. He's holding the camera, and I've got to give him a lot of credit because I, I've i always loved talking about this stuff. I had no idea about social media and YouTube and the power to bring people together that it has, so that's been really exciting. And um, meeting a lot of fun people, uh, Yvonne is definitely among them. Um, let's see here. Uh, let's see. I'm sure there's a lot, and I'm sorry I can't see all of you to uh, acknowledge you individually, but it is really fun having you here. Oh, that's 6250. I was thinking it was, for a moment I saw an insanely low price on that, but that was just me wishing. Oh, lots of signs here, and okay. I want to know what is happening here. What is this telling me I'm it supposed to avoid? Golf ram cart? Your, ram your vehicle. Oh, I see. And then the wheel will fall off and fly away. Yes. So don't take the buffalo seriously. I, I do remember they told us this when we went to Yellowstone Park. They were like, if you see buffalo, take the picture from inside the car. And I got out to take the picture and the buffalo immediately turned and I jumped right back in that car. That thing is huge. And it wasn't like the nice ones at the animal farm either. It was, it was not wanting a piece of bread. <laughs> oh, yes. We were just talking about how these gas stations are all there. Kate, that, uh, Kate from Follow That Bug was just talking about how uh, uh, gas stations fascinate her because she travels across the country and Bucky's is one of those that advertises for miles and miles and miles. Yes, that's right. Um, why do people collect signs? Sometimes it's because they think it's funny. Um, sometimes it's because it's their family surname. Sometimes it's because they had a 1976 Thunderbird and they want to put that in their garage. Uh-huh, all of that. 
Um, it could be because they have a helicopter or just aspire to one. Uh, a bunch of these are Kansas state signs. I gave one of these to a friend of mine from Kansas because it was the route that went through the town he grew up in and he thought that was pretty cool. So all of these old signs that they take down have to go somewhere and fortunately they don't all just go into the recycle bin. Yes, that one. Um, reflectorization is something that gives you a clue as to age. This is a lot newer than the ones that don't have that at all. I could go with Gay Street. Um, well, uh, in somebody's world. Um, Ohio to Erie Trail, you know, a lot of it is also, oh, I live there. Now, this is the kind of railroad sign, if you can find them, that you want to look for. We can show that one. It's easier. Oh, yeah, that's easier. Yes, thank you. Yeah, anything with these, ref uh, with these glass marbles. This is before they had the ability to do reflectorization, so they needed something that would reflect back at you, so they would put glass in the signs if it was a really important thing, like don't stop on the railroad track or stop when the signal turns red. And marbled signs are all good money now. Even if it's a boring sign that just says stop, they sell for hundreds of dollars potentially. Um, I've always liked the red striped hazel atlas tumblers. And that is one thing that sells for me every single time I get one. Every single time. They just, they sell without fail. And then I see some baby swung bases here, yes. And boy, the prices. Everyone is just really onto the swung base phenomenon now, which I feel happy about because I remember when I was the only one who liked them. So, oh, this is really nice. You can't see the face because the tag's over it, but this is a really beautiful French garniture set, the clock set with the two urns. The urns are just decorative. They don't open or anything, uh, but French clock making in the late 1870s when this was made was the, the peak. This is when they dominated that industry in the world and their things were considered very lovely and refined and they're still pretty as collectible opposed as opposed to that, which is a good example. This is a good example side by side. So we have something of great quality that has survived and is collectible because it's of great quality and beauty. And then we have something really silly that was made to last about 10 minutes and that one somehow still works and is in its original box. And that makes it collectible. So when I hear people say, oh, the reason people like old things is because they were so well made. Well, mm, maybe. <laughs> oh yeah, the Tropicana radio, it has to have its straw, but it will sell for $28 every time you get one. I get that every time I get one in Florida and they just go right out, but it's gotta have that straw. Let's see here, we've got Hummels, we've got Hurricane Shades. For This is a harder um, color to uh, get where you've got the milk crest on top of the emerald. Who made this? The cat oh. jumped over the Oh yeah, that's a fairly oh, famous oh. one. Dorian of California made that. They didn't make very much stuff at all, but they were around in the late 60s, you can tell by the avocado color. Yeah. And that was probably the most famous piece they made. I've seen it in a beige with um, multicolored paint on it, I think, as well. Beautiful reticule there in the frame. That's a nice large one. Um, Daniel Cleese, a viewer of mine, uh, gave us a very good hint. He uh, participates in the chats, which, by the way, if you're on our regular channel, if you don't already know, we do a, uh, the main channel, The Antique Nomad. We do a premiere every um, Monday and Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern, and you are welcome to join us in live chat there, and then I can be more interactive than I can here where I can't see the feed. Uh, but anyway, one of the people in the chat I showed one of these and he made a very interesting observation and he said the reason the old ones are bigger is because women carried fans in the late Victorian era. It had to be able to fit your fan and then when carrying fans went out of style they get half the size. And I did not know that so that's an interesting clue for aging and dating things. Oh here's some, I know we're after Halloween but these are really hard to find which is why they're priced the way they are. These honeycomb hats and they must have found three in a drawer somewhere. I mean, you can tell why even just having sat in a drawer, they're kind of crinkled and you could imagine how they ended up. Um, but yeah, boy, the Halloween die cut set, the old stuff is just really, really neat. And I find very little of it. I actually found a little stack of them. I had them in my box at an antique mall. 
I decided I wasn't going to put them out. A woman walked by, saw them in the box, and was like, I'm not leaving until you sell these to me. So I had them for like 10 minutes. <laughs> um, other interesting stuff. I like that. I also like the piece underneath it here. This is the Mark's International Jet Port and the American Lines Aerojet at Airport. So you could do an entire plastic airport set in your living room if you were a kid. Not many parents wanted their kids to take that much room up for playing, so they're not easy to find. They didn't make a whole lot. Oh yes, Wally and the Bee. <laughs> Yeah, 1980s nostalgia for the 1950s. Now we're 40 years after the 1980s, and 1980s stuff is where the nostalgia is. Let's see what else we have here. We're under another speaker, so I better keep talking. Here's aisle five again. You know, maybe next uh, May when we have the Springfield Antique Show, some of you folks, if you really love antiquing, Maybe this is where you take your spring trip because um, I'll be here, I'll be, uh, it'll be fun to meet you in person, and there are so many amazing stores. There's another antique pavilion near here that is maybe half the size of this, but it's right down the road too. There is a ton of antiquing in this area, and then the extravaganza has got like 1,500 to 2,000 dealers, so it's a lot of fun, and that'll be, I think it's the middle of May, like around the 15th. Red Wing, I always thought, was an interesting company because they figured out to go modern when a lot of the pottery companies were doing the same old thing and went out of business. That's a 1950s piece with that speckled glaze and that uh, diamond shape. And the prices are not bad. A lot of Red Wing pieces sell in that um, $25 to $45 range, and they made some really neat stuff. Oh, let's see here. Yes, these, I believe, are in Poli. I still have my big pitcher like this. It's neat that they have a pair of them. This actually is a fun space. They have a few things that are interesting. I'm not sure what that sculpture is. Oh, it's Orchid, I see. I almost see a face here, that's funny. I wonder if it tells us who this is. This is another thing I like about these stores is it's a great way to learn, to walk up to something you've never seen before and see if you can learn more about it, but it doesn't seem to have a signature. Interesting piece though. Oh, and then this guy. This is McCoy, and this is the, these are the frogs that McCoy did more work on and more painting, and they're very collectible now. They have some that are just laying back, but this guy is standing there ready to be fed, I think. They came in about four different sizes as well. Let's see what we have in here. Some nice old porcelain. I'm finding some market for really good quality pieces of old porcelain, but it's got to be exceptional. If it's just okay, it's not really moving so much. These folks are restocking a coin space here. There's several coin spaces in the mall. Oh, I like this gal. I almost bought her. She's celluloid and she's a dresser set when you turn around you can kind of see it from over here she's got a little rouge pot and a bunch of the implements but she was missing a few of them and so i ended up leaving her but i'd never seen her before i thought that was kind of cute this figurine is dresden an interesting thing i found out recently about dresden china is it's beautiful stuff everything they bought was made in mice and dresden was where they decorated things it was not where it was produced Since we're in Ohio, I'll point out hull pottery as well. Um, hull pottery is not nearly as collectible as it used to be, and it really surprises me because the quality is good and it cannot be reproduced because the technology was lost in their fire and flood. And so I keep thinking people are going to start catching on to it. I think now that we're starting to see gray tones, those colors look good with them, and we'll start to see customers again. and they're very efficient about how they do things here. They keep really good track of whose is what and things are separated at the counter and they're just, they, they definitely are a professional outfit. Ooh, I haven't seen one of these since my sister worked at Elsie's restaurant in Silverdale and they had one of these and I would, yeah, that's actually neat too. Uh, and I would stare at these cause they were neon. They're from about 1950 and then they would use day glow paint 
and they would paint signs for local businesses and sell them advertising. And while you sat there and ate, these things would flip. And as a kid, I would just stare at it because my parents would be you know, having some boring adult conversation. And I just thought they were fascinating. Let's see. Yeah, but made in Meissen is not necessarily sword Meissen. They had a number of manufacturers there. That is true, Vanilla Lux, yes. There were many manufacturers in Meissen, and it was not just the one company with the cross swords. And of course, there's also a million reproductions of cross swords, so you kind of have to know your marks and what to look for. The Alexandra. Uh, yes, this is legit. You can tell by the... Uh, yeah, this is an old red glass exit light-up sign, probably 1920s or 30s, where they just basically taped over this, dipped it in acid, and satinized everything else, and then they'd peel that off. Um, but you can tell it's old because of the patina on the, on the thing here. So, yeah, that's, that's definitely legit. Okay, so somehow we made it back to where we started, so... Yeah. Okay, well then I guess we probably will stroll on over there and say goodbye, and um, it has been really enjoyable getting to do this. I'm glad we got to go live. We just so rarely are in a building where it can do this. And so um, do, uh, do check out, all of us are gonna have video from here and from various other things here in Springfield that we've been doing. So, um, you know, check out Crazy Lamp Lady, check out Follow That Bug, and check me out on the Antique Nomad on the main channel. And thank you so much for uh, coming along with us. I'm glad we got to have fun this afternoon. We'll look forward to being able to chat directly with you on Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern in our next premiere. Bye for now. <laughs>